May you do with all God's people grasp the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of Christ's love. We respond to that love and praise by listening to and joining in, in our heads and our hearts with the enjoyed. We are here to praise you.
voice as we're telling. I know we've been singing for a few weeks now behind masks, but it's almost like uh, people have adjusted and there's a new confidence and uh, just felt the praise a bit more this, this morning than uh, maybe previous Sunday. So that's, that's a good sign too. Let's come before God in prayer. Father, we have just sung of how we are here to serve one another in response to our service to you. And that in doing so, we travel on a journey together, a journey of faith through life and with hope. And we give praise and we give thanks for this, O Lord. For so many people it's about meeting targets, reaching some destination that seems to always move away from them, never fully getting to where they are going. A sense sometimes of pointlessness, Yet we have a faith that teaches us that we travel. We travel from the point of our birth through our life to our death. And we have the promise of a hope beyond that because of Jesus Christ. Father, we are living through times where people are grasping here, there, and everywhere for hope and no doubt that's the basis of <coughs> continued false promises false destinations and a sense of growing despair Father we need not be like that because no matter what the situation is and regardless of the circumstances that we find ourselves in we continue to travel we continue to travel on that pilgrimage journey of faith. We continue to travel and meet new people along the way. We continue to travel and learn of the new resources that we didn't even know were there. Because we are pilgrims on a journey. So in the days that lie ahead, as people take their foot off the gas, as it were, during the holiday period, where some go to other places for rest. Help us to reflect on all that the last 18, 19 months has brought our direction and help us to keep on keeping on for the sake of Jesus Christ. Forgive us, Lord, that we have forgotten the richness of our faith, the resources that we have available to us in the Holy Spirit. Indeed, forgive us for all our sins, our transgressions and shortcomings, knowing that through genuine repentance and faith, we are a forgiven people. Lord, help us to let in the forgiveness and to emanate the message of salvation, hope and reconciliation to those that we come into contact with day and daily. Help us to be examples of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, by your Spirit, be it all that we say and do this day, in the name of and for the sake of that same Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Amen. Praise the song now from Angus and and.
living in a house of cedar, while the ark of the God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own, and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them any more as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people as well. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. Amen. Amen. Um, thanks, Myra, and thanks be to God for that Old Testament reading. Our New Testament reading is from Mark chapter 6. We're looking at verses, first of all, 30 to 34, and then 53 uh, to 56. So 30 to 34, and then John to 53, and we read to 56. Let's read, let's hear and listen for the word of God. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that he had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going, they did not even get a chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Jumping on to 53. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognised Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick and mats to, whatever they, to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns or countryside. They placed the sick in the marketplaces. And they begged him to let him touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Amen. And 
thanks be to God for both of these evenings from this most holy word and to his name be all the glory, the honour and the praise. Let's have our usual short prayer. Lord, be in our hearing, but also in our listening. Be in our minds, but also in our understanding. Lord, be in our hearts, and in our doing the things that you would have us do, in the name of and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Well, you've already heard this morning that uh, I'm about to go on holiday. Yay! But we're not the type of people who go on holiday to sit in beaches and to languish in the sun. We like to do the historic thing, to move around wherever we are, looking at all the old buildings and castles and ruins that we can find, and to give consideration to historical things usually of Scotland, I have to say. Castles, cathedrals, bishops and kings, reminding us of the rich variety and history of Scotland and south of the border too, and indeed across Europe and the globe. But most of our time is spent in Scotland, a place that is ever changing and always responding. In one year, I, just a few years ago actually, we visited a place called Spiny Palace in Elgin up near Romand, he says. And we went to see this Mahusov building. And it wasn't the residence of a king or a queen, it had been the one-time residence of a bishop. It was a massive house where pre-Reformation bishops entertained in lavish and palatial conditions. And it reminded me that uh, within the church for those bishops there was a degree of opulence that was a far cry from the activities of an Artesian carpenter and a group of fishermen who dropped absolutely everything to tell the poor to be prepared for God's plan of salvation. As a precursor to the Reformation, these bishops in general had lost their sense of priority and like the great King David himself before them, fell into the trap that rich, wealthy and powerful people often fall into. Fall into the trap of believing that the God of all creation needs the same trappings as they crave. The same trappings of worldly kings and princes. Now we know from reading our Bible that David was in fact a king after God's own heart. And he knew God well, and he was blessed by God, and he lived in fear of God all of his life. Yet despite that very close relationship, like the rest of us, he sometimes got things wrong. And he was getting things wrong regarding building a house for God. It was well meaning enough, but nonetheless it wasn't something that God required or even wanted. It wasn't God's way of working. And that's why my regret is wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, 
Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Of course, God had never asked that. And it's just as well Nathan the prophet was still listening to what God was saying. Because he had to pass on the news to David that God wasn't really interested in staying in lavish buildings like kings. The king of heaven did not require a palatial palace or a special building to be present with his people. And that's why I've always struggled with church buildings being referred to as the house of God. It's bad theology and it's unbiblical. It's a building like any other building. It may come to be blessed because of God's presence within it. It may come to be blessed because of the spirituality of the people who gather and worship there. But when all is said and done, God does not need a building. And this building in which you are sitting in is no more the house of God than anywhere else where God's people gather to worship. This may be regarded as a house of God, but so is the man's, because there's believing people over there. This may be regarded as a house of God, but so is your house the minute you start to praise Almighty God. In fact, did God say to David through Nathan, I don't need a house of wood and cedar. I'm happy with a tent because I go to be wherever my people are. The security that David was seeking was understandable and it was natural. But it wasn't a lavish palace or a big house that God was interested in. What God was interested in was the quality of the household of faith. In other words, the relationship that God's people had with him. And of course we know that that promise reached its perfection, if you like, beyond the nation of Israel through a carpenter who was in fact himself in the line of David, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. And something that we have to note about Jesus' ministry was it was not dependent on synagogues or temples because his ministry, though he frequented these places, was by and large an itinerant ministry. A ministry where he got out and about among the people, not demanding that the people go to a special place, but happy when the people gathered around him, when he made himself available to them. The passage that we read from Mark's Gospel is talked or tops and tails two miracles that we've often heard about the feeding of the 5,000 and the calming of the storm, which we looked at not so long ago. And something of note is that when Jesus and his disciples were so busy, they found it difficult to find a place for themselves to be at rest. And that's why Jesus suggested, well, let's get into the boat and try and get away. But what got out there that Jesus was on the move? And on both the passages that we looked at within Mark's Gospel, we see that because of Jesus' 
popularity and what he has to say, no matter how hard he tried to get space for himself, quite often people pitched up. And what did Jesus do? Did he say, oh, I'm too tired. I have to get away. I'll see you tomorrow. No, we read that in fact, despite their tiredness and their weariness, Jesus had compassion on these people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he got about the business of doing what God had called him to do and to bring healing and salvation to all who came his way. He, in doing so, showed how much he actually cared. Not about fabric, but about people. We here in Ochterden and Kiglasi are a Christian community bearing witness to the love of Christ because of this fact. Some coldy monks a long time ago came out of their places of reflection and as part of their ministry mixed with the people of this small rural community and engaged with all around them. Not so hankered by the trappings of Romanism, these pre-Reformation monks, in a similar way to Jesus, travelled out with their faith and they passed it on as they journeyed on their way. <clears throat> Hard as it is to imagine, that is part of our heritage. It's part of the heritage of this wee kirk that people got out from behind closed walls and started talking to people about Jesus Christ. And it shouldn't just be part of an historical heritage. It's also part of our spiritual heritage that keeping with the ministry of Jesus, Jesus calls us out to share our faith. There's a lot of talk in the Church of Scotland just now about the surplus of buildings that we have. There's a lot of talk in the Church of Scotland just now about buildings that we cannot afford to keep going. In fact, the initiative that's been running for a few years now is the right spaces in the right places. And what that means is ultimately if the space is not deemed to be in the right place, then something will have to change. You see, buildings can be a useful tool, but they're never meant to be a hindrance to the gospel. And we have two magnificent buildings. But over the next months and years, we have to ask ourselves, are they a useful tool? Or are they a hindrance to what we're actually trying to do? Palpable silence as the wheels turn and people are thinking, is a minister talking about shutting us down? It wouldn't be me that shut anybody down in any way, it would be the presbytery. And so we have to make all the resources that God has given us work for us, not work against us. Now as it happens, I think 
that where we are is a special spot. And not just because of this beautiful building, but it's a special spot because there's been a worshipping community here, arguably since the 11th century. It's that that makes it special, not the, the particular bricks which the building is made of, because this is not the first building that's been here. So we have to make what we have work for us. And David thought that God needed a special house. And it was God through Nathan that said, no, I don't. Because I have travelled with my people wherever they have gone. Attempt is good enough for me and the people on the move. We all have to journey with the gospel, and for some of us, that's more literal than for others. But it still acts as a useful metaphor of that in advancing the gospel. We have to be out and about. We had prior to the pandemic, it's in the distant, and distant past now, but Path of Renewal was an initiative of the Church of Scotland about us renewing our attitudes and renewing everything that we do for the sake of mission. Now that's still there, milling around in the background, but by and large, circumstances have changed so dramatically because of the Church of Scotland's call to radical change and of course the pandemic that the whole Church of Scotland now say we need to do mission we need to do mission if we're going to survive friends we should have been doing mission from the very outset but I fear that as an institution we sat in the laurels for far too long when Jesus was telling us to get out in a boot and to share our faith. So it's become clear to the entire Church of Scotland that the traditional models of church have served their purpose and they are now no longer fit for purpose in the face of the changes that have been forced upon us. And so we have to be ready to respond as God wants us to respond. As I was saying to the folks last week in Linktown, we need to exercise a willingness and a flexibility to do what needs to be done to ensure that the Christian gospel continues to be preached. So it's not about closing down buildings. It's about ensuring that we are where we should be under God and doing the things that God wants us to do. Because friends, I love worshipping in this building. I love its history. It has a place. It feels that it should continue to be useful. But we need to make sure it doesn't become a burden that stops us doing what our primary task is, and that's to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of us have been quite excited, and it was one of the reasons I, uh, one of the attractions for me when I came here about Fife's Pilgrim's Way. Because the church has rediscovered, the Church of Scotland has rediscovered the importance of pilgrimage, of travelling together on a journey. And it reminds us that we are in fact a pilgrim people. A people called to be on the move. 
out from behind our walls, rubbing shoulders with others in the towns and villages that we find ourselves in. That's the spirit of what the drop-in is all about. It's not just to put food in people's bellies, although that's, that's good. But it's about engaging with the community. Because let's face it, because of modern living, if we weren't encouraged to get out and do things, we could live our entire lives behind the four walls of our homes, couldn't we? How often do we hear people in the Church of Scotland lament that we're not as sociable as we used to be? I had a long moan and groan with my father-in-law about the rains or the bears in this part of the country. Oh, the rains these days. You can't even get them out of their bedroom. They're sitting with a screen in front of them, either it's a television screen, or a computer monitor, a tablet, or a phone. It's not like it was in my day. In my day, during the school holidays, the sun was up, you had your breakfast, you were out, and you came home when the sun went down. How did you survive? Dead easy. You went in all your pals' houses and their mothers fed you. That's how you survived. You were out and about, socialising, developing skills. I'm not saying that all about computer technology is bad. We've now got a different kind of reach when we record our services. People who don't come into the building, or well, Sunday some of them look at it on screen. Some people say that's a good thing, others say it's not so good because it discourages people from actually coming to the building on a Sunday. And I say that it can be quite good because people who couldn't get out of a housebound, they're at least engaging and so you make it work for you. So we have to make the resources that God gives us work for us. So, Jesus was available for the people. The people who didn't quite get it. The people who were searching the people who were asking the questions. And here's my question as I swore off in holiday. How do we keep on sharing the gospel with those around us? How do we make what we have work for us and not to become a burden. Here's something to think about in conclusion. There's been a lot of talk in the current session about this kind of stuff, the need to change, and it's something that the current session recognises, but it's a mammoth, a mammoth task. But it used to be in the old days that the elders had a responsibility for a district, they would shut the doors, usually before communion, and they would be invited into people's homes and they would spend the time of day with people. And in fairly recent history, they would chat about everything except religion. They would just socialise with people. They would show people that they still cared, that they were being invited to church. But by and large, that's gone. And I was sharing with the folks of Lintown Parish Church last week. I'm tired of all my elders being discouraged because they get a shut door. No longer invited in the way they used to be. No longer having the opportunity to sign, spend the time of day with people that they wouldn't otherwise. Sure, there are some doors that they get invited in with, but that's usually people who come to church anyway. So we have to change what we're doing. Stop banging our head against a brick wall or a wooden door in this case and find new ways 
to engage with people. And my heart just kind of started that, back to the drop-in idea. That's what the project behind the church hall is about, not just to make the grounds look pretty, but to open up a space where people can come feeling unthreatened. Because friends, believe you me, stepping across the threshold of a church door, if you haven't been there for 15 years, is no easy thing to do. Now thank God there's a few people in this congregation says I've come who've actually done that, they've, just, they've stepped over the door. But you will hear stories about how difficult that is. So how do we make it easier for people to hear the gospel? POR, part of New, was part of a motivation to that end. But it's all changed. We're in new territory. And we have to remember that with God, all things are possible. So as we say in the hymn, for my sake and the gospel go and tell redemption's story. Amen and thanks be to God for that preaching from his word and to his name. Be the glory, the honour and the praise. So with these thoughts about moving out, about pilgrimage and so on, 5.30 in the hymnal, one more step along the world I go.
it's not very difficult to think of how troubled our world is. We've always known that, but it seems all the more acute because we are in a global pandemic. We light the candle to remind us that Christ is the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. Let's come before God in a time of prayer. Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, it seems that there is difficulty all around and some of us have been having conversations about how prominent death seems. We're aware that it is part of life. We're aware that there is a moving on. But it just seems to be everywhere just now. And it is everywhere. More than we have been used to. And it's easy to feel crowded with darkness as we think of all the death that we see across the whole world in rich countries and poor. But of course it's the poor who suffer the most. And while we look for ways to alleviate that suffering because Jesus took the gospel to the poor. Your word through Old Testament and New Testament talks of a God who is there for the poor. And so, Father, we ask that your church would find a way of not only telling people that we care, but showing them that we care. We're doing a small bit through our missionary, Jenny Featherston, raising money for her work in Zambia. But we are also aware that's a drop in the ocean, not only in terms of Zambia, but the rest of the world. And so we come before you and we ask for your help, O oh Lord. We ask for your spirit not only to sustain us, but to enliven us and to give us the words to present these people before you. We pray for our leaders who are making decisions in difficult circumstances, but quite frankly at times seem to struggle to know what the right thing to do is. We may be critical where that criticism is justified, but we may also be supportive when we know just how hard it is to get things right when nothing's right. So be with our leaders internationally, nationally, locally, and might we find it justice that you call us all to taking place in our communities. But we don't forget those who struggle just to get through everyday life. Be with them. Be with those who are sick in body, mind or spirit. Be with the bereaved, both those affected by COVID and those not. And help us as we have been seeing that we are a journeying people, a people who travel onward regardless of the circumstances, facing the obstacles and overcoming them, journeying on through the twists and turns of life, and never alone because of Jesus. Father, we give thankfulness to you for all that is good in our life, for the care that we do experience 
where our doctors, our nurses and our scientists are doing terrific work. And for those who, in every sector of life, just keep the wheels turning. And in that sense of thankfulness, we give our gifts of money to you as a token of our appreciation. But more than our money, we give of ourselves. Help us to serve you, O Lord. Help us to share the good news and love of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, our power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And with these prayers, go forth in peace and keep alive the faith. And might the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us this day and forevermore. Amen.